couple of years ago, uh, well actually if you go today and look on Flickr, uh, there is an Objective C, Objective J pool. Anybody remember what Objective J is or ever heard what Objective J is? Probably like five of us or ten of us. Objective J, uh, which is not really so much around anymore, was kind of a web version of, of, of Objective C. Um, uh, with the guys from Cappuccino, which got bought by Motorola. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, these are some of my friends. This is Craig uh, at NS Snow doing the Square Bracket Gang sign. Um, this is, yeah, uh, by the way, great uh, uh transitions, uh, keynote transitions now. Like, I'm going to give you every single one. Um, these are two other guys at NSNO 2013. What's funny was we went snowboarding with about uh, like 13 or 15 uh, Cocoa developers uh, and they almost killed me, and not in Xcode, but on the, on the track. Um, that's another friend of mine in, uh, in, in France, um, guy I know. That's me, four times me. Uh <laughs> and that's again me in front of the Apple Store in Paris, uh, in, in Louvre. Uh, and so a lot of people know me and know the conference for the square bracket, gang, sign, whatever, but the original one is this one, as far as I remember and I can tell. And now here's the question. Does anybody can tell from what year this picture is from? Besides you, obviously, Walt, you're not allowed to answer. Like, what, what year is this? It's after 1984. <laughs> and it's before 2015. Uh, it's after 2003, as far as I can tell. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Well, actually, I, I cannot be wrong because, uh, because you know, I'm like, I'm like Apple. Uh, because this picture is actually has been taken on uh, October 20th, 2006, uh, which should be the very first C4, uh, if I recall correctly. Everything is correct. Um, so um, C4, the mother of all. Um, what is C4? Some of you might remember it, some others not. I do remember it because the day, the year where I said, I'm going to go to C4 this year, Wolf actually said, there's no C4 anymore. So, <laughs> same thing happened to me, by the way, with uh, Singleton in Montreal. Thank you guys over there. I'm going to go to, s I'm not going to go. Um, but, uh, but I'm definitely going to go to NF North, uh, if I can make it next year. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> Is there something to announce? <laughs> Probably I shouldn't announce that I'm going to conferences. Um, so I, I am not going to Objective Cologne next year. <laughs> um, uh, SwiftConf. Um, so are you one of the cool, uh, the cool one or what? Uh, we were at DubDub this year and um, I was speaking to someone and I was introducing uh, Wolf and that guy said, are you one of the cool one? <laughs> I thought the question was so funny. And uh, Wolf really uh, uh, humbly uh, entered, um, um, uh, answered um, that he used to be one of the cool ones, but he's not so much anymore. But it's not true, you're still one of the cool ones, anyways. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for doing C4 back in the days because it probably inspired Scotty in some ways and it then probably inspired me in some ways. Um, and uh, feel free to make it again, like, like, you know, like 15 years later. Hey, we're back! <laughs> um, um, and yeah. S about Wolf as being persisting, and, and, and it's funny to talk about persistence uh, when you talk about one of the guys who's going to speak about data, but I've been persisting, as far as I remember, since 2012 to try to get him uh, speaking at, at, at Objective Cologne. <laughs> so this is why persistence pays, um, with or without core data. Uh, speaking of which, speaking of core data, I totally, when I think about Wolf, I also think about that, um, which are the striped core data tutorials. Like, <laughs> I'm not even sure, are they still online? They are probably still online. Yeah, they're, online. they're online, yeah. So this is funny. If you want to learn core data, go back and learn it with the OS 10.1 look and feel. It surely is very interesting. Um, anyways, I am super, super uh, uh, happy to have this time around uh, Jonathan Wolf Wrench. So please welcome him. Thanks. I can represent my full name and two emoji characters. So not too many people have that, <laughs> have that uh, ability. So. so I'm finally, I'm happy that I finally get to give this talk. So 
uh, I did a podcast with a friend of mine, Andrew Pontius, and called Edge Cases. And we recorded 128 episodes before we said, okay, that's enough. I had enough talking about, uh, talking about what I want to talk about. Well, not really. So I had a future topics list. And so 128 episodes, that covers three, maybe four years of a weekly type thing. Not really, but there were some breaks. And the, there was that list, it's funny, because like, for the longest time, I thought, I'm just going to run out of stuff to talk about. And, but the, that list always had items on it. And I'm really happy to give this talk, because one of the items on it was this talk. And it, I, I kept on bumping down the list of things that I, uh, it was, it, every week was not the week to talk about. Because I realized it was going to really benefit by having some visual aids. And podcasts aren't a great, a great uh, uh, channel for that type of stuff. So I'm happy that finally this item that's been in, that's in, been in my head, in my thoughts for a couple of years now, I finally can, can get out and uh, infect all of you. So um, in episode 56 of the Accidental Podcast, John Syracuse talked about the nature of software engineering versus other type of engineering disciplines. And initially, I was going to put Syracuse's headshot up there, but it felt very like Bill Gates at the Macworld Boston Expo, <laughs> and like kind of looming over us. And so I, I decided it was a, so this went with his uh, handy dandy little um, copyright infringement free version of the Susan Kerr classic icon. Anyway, the, the title of that uh, episode was The Woodpecker. And it comes from this famous quote, uh, possibly from Gerald Weinberg, that's where I've seen it attributed to. If builders build buildings the way programmers wrote programs, the, then the first woodpecker that came along would destroy civilization. And there's a lot of truth in that, right? Because software engineers have a reputation for building buggy software. And I think it's earned. If you contrast it to other, other engineering disciplines, like, uh, say, bridge building, uh, for the most part, bridges don't fall down randomly. Um, this is a pretty, pretty nice feature, I have to say, of a bridge, not to fall down randomly. Uh, even though bridges are far more complicated than software, uh, civil engineers seem to have a mastery of their craft that we don't. And uh, by the way, I just love this bridge. I tweeted about it. Um, is in uh, Dusseldorf. So civil engineers can get their act together, and we can't. So why is this? Is it because software engineers are dumber and lazier than other engineers? Uh, Syracuse also addressed this point, that this, this entire uh, line of argument, I wouldn't call it ad hominem, but maybe it is. Um, it, it's a, it's a cop-out. Like, why do people do the things they do? Oh, they're stupid. And it's, 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 it's such a, a shallow response to a line of questioning that it's, uh, I always bristle at that kind of way of thinking about things. So I always think, what's, what's really going on here? What's the next step in here? Um, so I am personally often dismayed at our profession. Um, so I I'm, I'm maybe even have a little bit of sympathy for that line of explanation. Um, especially when you see the uh, learn Java in 20 days books and, and stuff like that, right? It's, it seems like there's, there's, a, not, there's a lot of uh, registered and licensed fields have a, perhaps more like a discipline that we don't. But we also have a lot of dynamics in our fields. But anyway, um, I, I, so Syracuse argued that it stems from some, something fundamental, that's, that software engineering is fundamentally different from other types of engineering. And it's a, it's a one-two punch. It's number one, software engineering is very low level. We start at something, we start with bits, ones and zeros, right? And it's wholly artificial. That is, everything about it is defined by humans. So it's like we start at the subatomic level and then we design physics from the ground up. 
And so this is the cool thing about this is that software is totally knowable, right? That uh, starting from these bits, we go all the way up, and, and the systems we run today, that we know we can know everything about them. The downside, or the other, the other side of the coin, is that it's also completely changeable by humans. So, civil engineers successfully leverage approximate models of unchanging reality. The problem with software is that it's mutable layers of abstractions piled upon themselves. And those abstractions change from operating system patch to bug release to different versions. So I can't find it anymore, anywhere. But I believe JWZ made the analogy that writing software is like trying to build bookshelves out of peanut butter. It's, uh, you know, as you're trying to build up, it's like things can change out from beneath you. It's not really meant to carry its own weight. So civil engineers, they deal with approximate models of unchanging reality. They deal with real physics. And it's interesting, right? Because civil engineers are not physicists, right? Physicists have already done the basic research and development. But they have their own tables of, if you want to carry this load, look up the table. It has to be this amount of mass in the concrete, this type of steel, this type of tension. So this is something that they leverage the research and development of physicists and scientists to leverage to have these approximate models. And you know, they're, they're not at the subatomic level here, right? But they're able to leverage it. And is highly practical. And as software people, with our physics of our reality changing out from underneath us as we go, as we write software, we don't get to assume steel and concrete. Or do we? So my assertion is that data is software engineering's concrete. And I mean that as a, as a bit of a pun, both as a noun and an adjective. As a noun, data is our best building block. As an adjective, we have this concept that when you say you're going to make something concrete, you're making it real. And so data in the digital realm of the things we build up from, from these bits, for the subatomic realm, we're building things up, data is the least abstract thing we have in our realm. We can effectively layer additional abstractions on top of it, knowing we have a tractable base. So the nature of data, with its minimal abstraction, arguably none, is the closest we can come to unchanging reality. It's an anchor in the sea of mutability. I love this quote. Show me your flowchart and conceal your tables, and I shall continue to be mystified. Show me your tables, and I won't need your, usually need your full chart. It will be obvious. Fred Brooks in 1975, the mythical man month. Data is simple, but it's surprisingly expressive. Data is easy to reason about, especially immutable data. It just sits there. It invites comprehension, it invites pattern matching and exploration. This is how we use debuggers most of the time. We set a breakpoint, we go to where the program is misbehaving, and we look at the data. And this isn't a coincidence, because this is the nature of data. Data is the maximum nexus between humans and machines. And man, I've gone through so many, so many images for this slide. A lot of them were cyborgs, I have to admit. But you know, this one's a little bit more friendly. We have limited minds. Miller's law says that our average working memory is seven objects plus or minus two. Interpreting code, that's stuff that actually gets work done, right? It's, you have to walk through lines of code and kind of like interpret it in your own mind. And it takes a great deal more effort than reading a data structure. And you can, when you have something in the debugger, you look at, you open a few uh, tree views, and zip right down to where you need to go. The interpretive, pro interpretive process doesn't even need to happen. We just scan. 
Fortunately, we can structure the software to maximize our wetware and our productive interactions with the machinery that we use. JSON. It's the triumph of the practical. It has no dates, and it really kind of sucks at binary. But it is pivotal in importance. We, we tend to look at JSON now and say, man, XML sucked, and this sucked less, right? And that's, to a certain extent, true. But JSON is very important to our industry. It codified simple collections in a syntax familiar to most programmers. And, and what seems like a limitation or a bug is actually a feature, is that it can only represent trees. So things like arbitrary object graphs, you can put a layer on top of that to represent it, but it only natively supports trees. It gave us a common, simple language. It gave us a common, simple semantics. It illustrated our actual needs for system interoperability. Gary Bernhardt gave this great talk at the Software Craftsmanship North America of 2012, and I highly rec recommend you, go, uh, you watch it. Uh, this is Gary Bernhardt uh, Boundaries. And one of the key insights of this talk is how interfaces that are suitable for data, that interfaces that you use data to, to interact with, help define module boundaries. So if you need to have objects talking to each other, uh, complex objects, uh, where they're talking about complex things, maybe those, def maybe those need to be inside the module. You can think of this as, say, uh, N uh, the NS Tech system. So you have layout system, you have the containers, you have this, and they're, they're the collaborating objects talking to each other with high, high fidelity ideas, right? But when you look at the as a module, you give it a string, you get pixels out, right? Data, in, data out. That's a boundary. The, he, he also mentions the idea of having a functional core and imperative shell as a way of structuring software. And it really looks more and more like a small talk style, object-oriented programming and functional programming aren't rivals. They're actually two halves of the same puzzle, but that's another talk in its own. So Tim Berners-Lee, he wrote this, uh, I think it was, two th I think I, I saw it in 2006, but I, I think it was, uh, goes back to maybe 2001. He wrote uh, an essay, The Rule of Least Power. And I'll quote from it here. The less powerful the language, the more you can do with the data stored in that language. If you write it in a simple declarative form, anyone can write a program to analyze it. Data is our least powerful language. It is the most concrete, it's the least abstract. And it, its nature aids in composability of systems. It's the lowest common denominator in a good way. Data is self-documenting. Often better documentation than, it's often better just lying there with introspection than documentation itself, right? It tends to be better in accuracy, clarity, and terseness. This is a chunk of JSON that came from Node's URL, URL.parse function. So you can go to the bottom line, the href, and you can see what I end up typing in. But looking at this, this structure that came out, it's just a dictionary, right? So it's not, it's not like an object with behavior. This is a data dump. But if you look at it, you immediately, you can't help but help, the data helps you decompose in your mind to figure out what the different components of it are. So if you look at, for example, host and host name, they're identical. This, you know, this is exactly the type of thing that, that jumps out at you when you look at the data versus if you were looking at documentation, you might stop at host, you might stop at host name. It wouldn't be obvious that these two things are redundant. This changes the behavior. Which one should I use? Well, maybe that's up in the air. And maybe now knowing this, you can better understand that there's this, basically this thorn that you could trip on. That's mixed analogies there, but oh well. Between search and query, right? 
there is a very little distinction here. One of them includes the question mark, one of them doesn't. And that stood out because uh, uh, you're looking at the raw data. This is exactly the type of thing that is hard to find when you approach it from a documentation first standpoint. If you're reading the documentation, you're going through and, and like, well, I, I know I need to pull out the last part of the URL, the query part, but I may, I, I'm going to look at query. But maybe I do want that question mark. Search is interesting, right? But it's, but it's not a slam dunk always. Slash is true. What does that mean? That it has URLs, has slashes in them, don't they all? Um, so it's, you know, it's, documentation is, it still serves a clarifying purpose. I'm just saying that data, just by itself, is amazing tool for documentation because it's so concrete. Here are three, I run through three different types of URLs in here, and we, we can look at the output together. For the first one, I switch it to a file URL, and we can see that pretty much a lot of these uh, fields that come back are null, and we kind of expect that, and that kind of fits our mental model of how this stuff works. You know, there won't be a query string on this thing. There's not going to be a host. Interesting enough, the host is an empty string. It's not null, like so much of the others are null, right? Protocol makes sense. But again, you see a bunch of edge cases here where the data could, where things could have gone either way. And this is obvious when you look at the data that comes out of it. This is why REPLs are so fantastic for, for learning systems. And so much uh, better than reading reams of documentation that may not be applicable to the problem at hand. The second one is a standard H a kind of our, uh, our uh, control. And let's take a standard HTTPApple.com. And, oh, I guess I have a copy and paste error. Sorry about that. I should have put the apple in there. But the third one is interesting. That you notice I left out the HTTP colon slash slash part. And you notice that the URL parser essentially breaks down, right? It interprets the colon as the entire protocol. So by opening up a REPL, typing in URL.parse and getting this data structure back, we've, without looking at the documentation, without looking at a bug tracker or issue tracker, we've discovered that there's this edge case that we could very easily run into. So the data concreteness party doesn't end there. We can use data to describe patterns of data. And we can call these schemes, we can call these things schemas or data models. And notice we haven't left the land of pure data yet. But we're able to describe so much more. It's very powerful, yet still very, very simple. So if you do yourself a favor one of these days, uh, pop open an XC data model file on a text editor. And it's very enlightening to see your, your, your diagram put into, it's, unfortunately it's XML, but uh, it's very enlightening to see the way you think about uh, these data models actually be represented in Dan itself. It's highly readable and enlightening. So let's build a shopping cart together and talk about these data models. I'm going to use uh, Active Record Ruby here. Uh, that's because it's terse. And we'll all go through it, but you should be able to follow along pretty easily. Um, of course, accounts, you need to keep track of personal information, first name, last name. Uh, probably the thing at the end is the most interesting, the has many, that's uh, the orders, account has multiple orders. An order has created a hat, uh, has, has a two one to account, um, has many line items. And a line item would be an order, that it belongs to, a stock keeping unit, a SKU. And a SKU has prices and has dates and has and things that have been purchased, and I hope everyone's falling asleep. And that's the idea. I'm really glad my presentation was before lunch, because <laughs> I definitely would have put you all to sleep. So as programmers, we're really good at building mental maps from textual descriptions. But, as I saw people nodding off, we're not excellent at it. This, I mean, we're so good at building you know, advent, uh, you know, models from textual descriptions, we have things like return to Zork. 
And it's even fun sometimes, but it's not fun there. Just because we're relatively good at it doesn't mean we should. This diagram contains the exact same information as the previous four slides. However, it's far more approachable. A, this simple diagram relieves us from having to construct an object graph from reading text. It takes far less effort and is far more, far more accurate. Spatial processing is your GPU. So when we're slogging through that textual description of those active records, we're using our CPU, man. We're just like, we're, like, we're good at it. We're, our CPUs are pretty hot, right? But we have this, you know, we, we have this animal brain. Like, you know, which way is the restrooms? You know that just from how you entered the room. We have this innate understanding because we're physical beings that, and we're primitive, right? And we have this lizard brain. And what's really cool is that this lizard brain can actually help us understand software. It's this entire new uh, other processing unit that we barely make use of. It's a great hack. So in 1960, Eugene Wigner published a paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics and Natural S Sciences. He pointed out that the law of gravity used to model free-falling objects extended via very scanty observations and to has been proved accurate beyond all reasonable expectations to model even uh, the, uh, the travel of the planets. It does make sense how, re how amazing math is to describe our physical reality. I feel the same way about entity relationship modeling, but I'm going to make it even more ridiculous because it's us boxes and arrows. Given a problem, it's unreasonably effective to walk up to a whiteboard and start drawing boxes and arrows and get a robust solution. When, when, I'm, actually entity, when I'm actually in the process of, of modeling entities and relationships, as you're working on it, questions naturally arise in the process. Often these questions are an, easily answered and you just keep on going, but oh, so often they highlight fundamental misunderstandings. So going back to the shopping cart example, Let's go with the account. OK, we also have this thing called orders, right? And yeah, they're related to accounts. So that looks about right. An account can have multiple orders, but an order can have one account. So interesting thing here is that two-one relationships often indicate ownership semantics. And ownership is one of the hardest things to reason about in systems. But simply drawing this arrow has given us a strong hint about what happens when we delete an account. Too many relationships often indicate a subservient role. You can think of a king and his subjects. And if the kingdom falls, all is lost. And sorry to get all Game of Thrones on you. So going back to our example, we noticed that line item, which we totally glossed all over because all your eyes were glossing over has this interesting thing, right? It has no 2 one relationships to it. Um, you can tell it's low man on the totem pole. So if you delete a line item, nobody sheds a tear. But if you delete a count, or delete, delete a uh, stop keeping unit, there's, there's, uh, that's much more significant. So thus again, this drawing boxes with, line of, lines, with lines and arrows has given you an insight about ownership semantics and what's important. And it was so easy. So a good indicator of software quality is what is the size of impact that needs to be made when changes ch happen? And this is where you get the entire thing like single responsibility principle, right? So if something changes, if you have a class that represents that responsibility, that's the only class that needs to change. When Apple's web objects migrated from Objective-C to Java, all its model files, it's, it had thing, this thing called Enterprise Objects Framework, which is like uh, core data back then. All its model files didn't continue to be valid. Apple changed the language from Objective-C to Java, and all your models were still valid. About the only thing you need to do is add a JDBC connection string. 
Likewise, with core data, Apple has Objective-C and now has Swift. Again, all your data models are still valid. Apple has changed the language twice. And that indicates a really good structuring of responsibilities. Because you've had this fundamental change. I mean, this is, it can't get any more fundamental than changing languages. But because things, you had the correct separation of responsibility, and because we kept data data, it was essentially relevant to that part of the program. So I'm a fan of model-driven development. And, but if you read only one book on the topic, I would recommend Eric Evans' Domain-Driven Design. And its cover is a bit uh, old-fashioned-y, but um, it's, I, I encourage you to look beyond the cover and the fact that it's hard to get. I don't even know if you can get an e-book, but it's, uh, it's worth actually putting on your physical bookshelf. So domain-driven domain -driven design you can think of as essentially a superset of model-driven design. And this book provides fantastic stories of working through actual problems. And so many of these programming books, they, you know, they, they're selling you a solution, right? Especially the methodology books. It's like, this is so awesome, you just need to do this. What I really liked about uh, domain-driven design is that it had humility from the get-go. It started with, we have this problem. This is, well, I don't really know how to deal with this. Here's the first things that come into my mind. Let's go to the whiteboard. Let's start drawing boxes and arrows and start hooking things up. And just in the process of hooking these up and leveraging that lizard brain, that GPU you have in your back pocket, it made it obvious where the gaps of knowledge were, where the misunderstandings were. So one of the other great things about this book is that it provides a vocabulary to discuss things. A big thing here is that you have the domain. Domains are vast and not totally knowable. So this is like something like air traffic control, right? That's a domain. That that's involves flights. That involves keeping things from smashing into each other in the, in the sky. It's huge, right? But we want to build a system that can help us with it. So that's where the models come in. Models represent a, pr uh, a practical, approximate subset. And that starts to sound a lot like civil engineers and how they deal with bridges. That physics is vast, right? We don't totally understand all of it. But we don't need to understand all of it to put up a bridge that stays up in an earthquake, right? Because we have an approximate model that does the job and it's highly practical. And we can do the same thing with these vast domains that no one human can even understand. But we can model them and we can use this to with the same type of technique that, that civil engineers can use to make sure bridges stand up, we can use in software. And finally, um, diagrams are, they're not models. And it's very tempting when you uh, bring up the Xcode data modeler, you, you start diagramming this stuff up, and you're like, okay, that's my model. It's a diagram of the model, it's a separate thing, and it's necessarily a subset of the model. And it's important you keep these things separate. Domain, uh, domain driven design services is one thing I want to call out from the book that mainstream object oriented programming gets wrong at least two basic things inheritance and coupling behavior with classes. And the first one of those, the inheritance, is a, is a talk its own right. So it's, talk to me later if you're interested in talking about it. Domain driven design's definition of a service definitely helps with coupling behavior with classes. So Mo generator is guilty here to make it easy to do the wrong thing. It's very easy to add behavior to classes, to add your logic to it. And how domain-driven design defines services is that you want to keep data separate as much as you can. I mean, it's one thing to have a person class, a person entity that has a first name ad attribute and a last name attribute, and you put a convenience method on there that has, returns a full name, right? That's, that's fine. But once you start putting like serious business logic into your entities, into your mo-generated classes, the, the, the coupling behavior there is not great. And I do recommend you have a separate class that represents these services.
So that is extremely important. And we saw how, even though it's so primitive, right? It is such an amazing enabling technology that we can actually use data to describe data. And it reinforces itself and gives us amazing capabilities. What I didn't talk about is um, user interfaces. And so which comes first? Um, user interfaces or data models? When you're walking up to a whiteboard and you're trying to figure out a problem, I find it's, as I mentioned, it's amazingly powerful to throw up boxes and arrows and model it out and figure out how software really works. However, that is not a user interface. And it's, it's a, you need to understand that um, how the data actually works is not something that you necessarily expose the user. In fact, usually that's a mistake. They have different workflows and they're not necessarily thinking in terms of how you're actually going to save all this stuff and persist it. So I view them as they, they feed into each other. So often I will trade off between time with the whiteboard, doing boxes and arrows, and time with the whiteboard, sketching out user interfaces. And one will inform the other. And I don't think it's an either or, but often the, there is a tension between the two. And by playing on both sides, you kind of meet in the middle. And don't get me wrong, there are totally, there are pure play user interface apps out there that does, are, barely have any backend component that all the magic is user interface, and that's fine. Different software has different needs, different architectures. That's fine if you recognize it as a pure play, the UI is really cool on this app thing. But I find those types of apps are actually pretty rare. So, summing up, data's non-abstract nature aids in understanding in our very limited human brain. You should leverage that. We have this amazing you know, lizard brain, this GPU, that we can use to leverage, I mean, that we can use this primitive hind brain to actually understand this high level concept of software is amazing. Models, data about data, are extraordinarily simple, but extraordinarily powerful. Their, their uh, strength to weight ratio, amazing. And when approaching software, we all know about sketchy user interfaces. And this is, I would say, maybe the default position to do. Sketch out the user interface, and we'll figure out what this app does. I'm saying boxes and arrows on our whiteboard, attacking from the other end, will give you the, the backbone of your application and can also help inform the user interface. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so if you guys have questions, think about it right now. And uh, as a general tip, write it down during the sessions. Uh, that's what I usually do. Um, so I'll start with my questions. First of all, when did you start wearing ties? <laughs> like I, 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 it's an invisible tie now. Okay, yeah. Because <laughs> you used to be the, that guy at the conference mm -hmm. coming with a tie. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, so now, a kind of a serious question. Uh, first of all, we start with a question which is not totally related with your talk, which is about core data. Mm -hmm. um, um, this year at DubDub, there were uh, uh, rumors before they announced the talks that there was nothing about core data. So everybody, everybody likes, was like, they're going to replace it or mm -hmm. whatever. But, um, as much as I love core data, and you probably do as well, a lot of time it feels to me that this is kind of an old technology, and mm -hmm. I still think like we're still at the next days, so to say. Mm -hmm. What's your, your take on this? So core data is definitely not without its flaws, right? Um, it's arguably the worst of both worlds, that um, if, you, if you understand its predecessor, Enterprise Objects Framework, it was, um, it, it was much more pluggable. And it was, uh, for example, it's, uh, core data went through two or three versions bef before it got a, pl a pluggable backend where you could have your own persistent storage format. Mm -hmm. um, Enterprise Object Framework was, had that, uh, where it was built to talk to multiple relational backends, stuff like that. And you had things like uh, comment separated value adapters that were in included, right? So this is, 
it was designed to be extensible. And core data was very much, let's weld the engine shut, mm -hmm. because we, we are going to make this simpler for you. Yep. Um, problem is, it's not simple. So it had, it had the kind of the, I mean, NS persistent store coordinator, right? The fact that we know about that is, you know, it's, it's. The, the, the name is wrong already. <laughs> it's, it's, it shows you like, the, yes, it has this amazing amount of flexibility, but for the common case, it is way too complicated. And I mean, I, I think it's, it's very damning that the, the, when you create a new Xcode core data project, for so long, the, the included source code about how to manage a core data stack was garbage, written, you know, written by interns with glaring flaws, right? And the fact that we needed that boilerplate at all, mm -hmm. right? And that Apple never gave us, we ne I mean, you look at the text system on OS X and now iOS, it's amazing. You know, that is desktop publishing with text flows and high-end features. That's desktop publishing built into the operating system, which is amazing, yet, we have NS text view, which makes it easy, right? And UI text view. It's just like, I know you have all these complicated features and amazing depth, mm -hmm. but all I want is this facade. I want this, this, uh, this high level object that does the common case. And core data has never had that. Mm -hmm. And frankly, I'm surprised it still doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. um, that said, um, and there are, uh, there are now multiple competitors to core data, and they have been over the years and all that. Uh, obviously, Core Data doesn't have the Apple halo, right? And so it's not going away. Obviously, Apple is going to keep on plugging away with it. I would really like it if it had a facade, right? And Mojanera gives you a little bit of that. Yeah. Uh, Magical Record gives you the rest of it, right? Yeah. Um, if you have things like, uh, I forget uh, what's the, the current hot property, the, the Core Data competitor. Yeah. Do you Realm, okay, Realm. yes. Realm. So Realm is a, a lot simpler for the common case, right? All right. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. so I guess I, no, <laughs> I have I, a lot I, to say on this. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, yeah, because I was, I was also thinking that Core Data is actually like pre-web um, and pre-JSON. Uh, so mm -hmm. JSON, so when I, um, I, I'm thinking about CouchDB or MongoDB, and mm -hmm. these are more modern, probably not as, 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 as whatever, mm -hmm. rigid and, and big for, mm -hmm. good for big data or whatever, but... Mm -hmm. But yeah, it seems to me that, that core data is still like 10 years ago. And it doesn't evolve very fast. If you compare it to SpriteKit, which is something totally different, right. SpriteKit has evolved for the last three years to crazy. Mm -hmm. And core data has evolved for the last 15 years <laughs> slowly. Uh, and so I would argue that, yes, for all the flaws of core data, its fundamental architecture is very sound. In fact, the best out there. Mm -hmm. The idea of starting with a model, as you saw with uh, the fact that we can jump, jump even languages, Tell me that's architected correctly. We can Apple can make massive changes, and your model survives those. It's amazing. Um, when you look at things like Mongo and CouchDB, it's, it's one, one of these things where, yes, it's great to be able to stash the hash yep. and just like put things in database and then query it later and all that. But guess what? You're going to eventually need schemas. Yeah. And it's funny, because uh, with the last time I was using uh, Mongo, I ended up using a wrapper for it uh, called Mongoose. Right? And that gives you schemas. And as soon as I added schemas, it found five bugs. And that's exactly the type of thing. Because software, when you're building composable systems, is all about interfaces. And you need rules. And that's how you do contracts. OK, okay I'm hearing we have a question from Canada. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. okay. Anybody else has questions also? I don't want to hog the mic all the time. But, <laughs> um, so my question is about uh, Mode Generator. For, so thank you so much for Mode Generator. But you. you mentioned something uh, about putting uh, more business logic into your generated classes. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was kind of the intent of it. It's like you're going to put logic in there that's not touched by the compiler every time that's you change exactly your model. That's exactly the idea. However, I can totally see the scope creep. So can you expand a little bit about how you would handle not putting too much logic in your classes that are mode generated derived? Yeah. So mode generator is a very practical tool, right? Um, it's, it's bad in two fundamental ways. Number one, the entire idea of code generation is bankrupt, right? Um, this, is, this is something that from a, from a Lisp standpoint, right? Code is added as code. Like, the fact that we even have to go through this phase where you have a model, you generate codes, so you can feed it back to the co computer, is a bad step. It's, it's a smell. But it's something we have to do, so I wrote the tool for it. 
Um, the other thing is that yes, and the entire idea was that separating the generation gap pattern, separate them out to make it easy so that you're not constantly overriding your, chain, your own code, your own business logic, custom logic, with the changes you make from the model. Um, I, that's great for you have these convenience classes, like the, the, the name appending, uh, first name, last name thing, uh, validators. Validators are great. Um, for almost everything else, I would try to move out a separate class. Because now this is all about the single responsibility principle, right? Like, you have this object that represents, you have this class that represents uh, something to be persisted, right? It is, it is, if you were to add more services onto that, now it's doing two things. And especially when you're doing you know, one, one entity, one class, it's maybe not so bad. But often services have to deal with collaborating objects, have two or more. All of a sudden, now it's like, does it go to class A or does it go to class B? Both are wrong. And that should tell you that it's actually, it actually belongs to neither. All right, cool. Anybody else has a question? Um, yeah. Uh, I have one last one, mm -hmm. uh, also because I just figured out that we are very late on the, on the, on the schedule, but it's because I uh, messed up something. Uh, so we're probably gonna, we're, we're gonna see if we can have dinner or uh, lunch already, sorry. <laughs> dinner is uh, really late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very early at dinner. But I have one last question, which is, it seems to me that your talk is trying to make of us software engineers uh, like better engineers mm -hmm. and like probably as good as yeah. uh, uh, you know those guys building those tunnels. Mm -hmm. uh, as a software developer, I get myself a lot of time like I feel kind of bad or frustrated to be that only software developer. I'm not even a hardware developer, right, right. And let alone being a doctor or something. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, what, what can we do about that hard feeling and, and, and what can we do to be better except for all the stuff you told us? <laughs> except for all the stuff I told yeah. us. I think it is, I, uh, the, it's important to recognize our field is fundamentally different from the rest. And I, that, that episode of Accidental Tech, Co Tech Podcast was a breakthrough for me because uh, I felt the same guilt that you feel, right? That I think where so much of us feel is that it feels like, especially with, with our, our, our quality is you know, so low compared to the other fields. Uh, but once, once you know the nature of things, then you can better understand what our, what our position is. And once you realize that the ground is always changing out from underneath us, yes, it's, it's, when the laws of physics are, physics are always, change, always changing, it's hard to keep up with it. Especially if you don't get to ship a new version with the, when the Opera system comes out. Okay. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks. Um, and you, I, I, I give you a cup as well. Obviously. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm going to check now if uh, lunch is already, and we might do a shorter version of the that lunch break. But yeah, Th thank you guys. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you both. <laughs>